Hello everyone. So today we're going to give you an introduction to declarative programming and how it can be applied to real world. I want to cover what, being, what writing declarative code means and how it allows us to write clear code. So nice to meet you all. Uh, my name is Kyle. Um, one of the core contributors on CocoaPods. By night, by day, I work at a company called Apri. We build, how allow you to build Markdown based documentation for APIs. Um, so, traditionally, we've done imperative programming. This is quite a common thing in Objective C. It's where we tell the machine how to do something. As a result, what we want to do will happen. We describe how to achieve our goals. In contrast, declarative programming is telling the machine what we'd like to happen, and we let the computer figure out how it can go about that. We describe what to do, not how to do it. So why would we do declarative programming? Well, declarative programs allows us to write clearer code. It's far more readable, and it's often easier for new developers to jump into, because there's less implementation details, because we're not describing how to solve a problem, but instead what we're trying to solve. It's much simpler. And it's often constraint-driven, so it means it's less room for errors or users or developers' mistakes, because we only let a developer write code in a certain way. So why are we not doing declarative program? Well, this is a good question. I'm not entirely sure about the answer, but I think quite often we're not really taught this way, and perhaps it's not always practical. All right, so let's jump into it. How would we go about doing declarative program? Well, there are a couple of ways of doing it. So there's one quite common you're probably familiar with, which is DSLs, or domain-specific languages. This is where we have a specialized language. It's usually built on top of another more general purpose language, such as Swift or Objective-C. Now, DSLs are qu quite often intuitive. They build with constraints, so it gives us less freedom to do what we want, and it forces us to work in a special way. There's usually only one way to solve a problem in a DSL. A good example of this, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, is regular expressions. Up here, we have a regular expression at the top. It's basically slash D represents a digit. So in his case, we're trying to match two digits separated by a forward slash separated by another two digits, and then another forward slash, and then four digits. So this might look like a date, such as today. We've built this like lookup or search term in a generic way, and it's not tied to any implementation details of any language. This regex will work across a variety of languages and different regex implementations. SQL is another quite known one, a structured query language. It's a declarative DSL, and you often describe what you're trying to do, and this also differs by implementation. For example, if we wanted to select all the comments where the author is Kyle, we might do an SQL query similar like this. We select asterisk, which represents every row in our table, from the table name, where, in this little filter, author equals Kyle. We didn't mention how to perform this query. Now, depending on the implementation, perhaps you're using some SQL server somewhere, or perhaps SQLite, the implementation could be vastly different. Another one that you might be more familiar with is NS Predicate. This is a declarative DSL for filtering. It's used to describe filtering regardless of the implementation. It looks something like this. We create an NS Predicate instance. We pass it a format string. In this case, we're trying to query if everything is with the name Kyle. Now, you can pass this to NS Fetch request, and Core Data will translate this to SQL because it's not tied to the implementation details. It can also be translated or you can perform this on NS arrays to just filter them by this query. Aside from DSLs, there's another way of doing character programming using functional programming. This is where you use programming via expressions. It's a paradigm in programming that promotes declarativeness. So let's take a look at what functional programming is and how it works. So what is it that makes a functional function functional? Well, when people talk about functional programming, they often mention these number of characteristics, such as first-class functions, mutable data, reducing, pipelining, recursion, carrying, monads. Let's ignore all that. Functional code is characterized by one thing, the absence of side effects, where a function doesn't rely on data outside of the current function or scope. It doesn't change data that exists outside. So let's look through by example. So what is not a functional function? Well, this is an example. We have function called increment, which 
when called, it mutates a variable in the global namespace called value. So immediately we can see this has a side effect when you call this function, it changes state outside of itself. Another one, in this case we don't have a global variable, but instead we're using a single term, and we're pulling a value out of it, we're changing it and saving it back. This is really hard to test, because it has a side effect. In contrast, a functional function might look more like this. We have not like, incremented anything outside of the scope of this function. We've taken a value, we've incremented it and returned the new value. There was no globals, and we used immutability. When you're looking at functional programming, you often come across this term, higher order function, and it's not quite clear what it means from these three words. So let's have a little look at it. So a higher order function is a function that takes another function as an argument. And it can also be a function that returns a function, instead, or maybe both. Now, in Swift, everything is a closure, so this works really well. And by this, I mean functions and closures are identical when used. It's not entirely true in computer science, but in Swift it is. Now, in Objective-C, this is slightly different. Let's take a look at what it's like in Objective-C. So we're going to look at all the callables, so things you pass arguments to and return a result. So imagine we have an object. This is how we're defining a method on it. We'd use this dash to represent it's an instance method. And then we'd define the return type, then the string, which called message, which represents what the name is of this method. And then finally the arguments to it. And then the implementation. Now we call this with square brackets, passing the object name, uh, the method name, and then the variables. We also have access to functions in C, which you define a slightly different, it's got the same kind of words in there, but it's totally different, and it works differently. And you call it differently. Then you have closures of blocks in Objective-C. You have a lot of duplicate data here because we defined the return type twice. And there's also, I'm sure you're all familiar with a similar site to this. Dozens of ways of def defining how blocks work. And you call them very similar to C functions. Now, let's go back to Swift. In Swift, something that's callable, you can represent pretty simply. It's something that takes a value and returns a different value. In this case, we might take a string and we return nothing. Now, when we define that as a closure within like a constant in Swift, we might use this kind of syntax. So let message equals and the exact same thing you saw on the previous slide. And you can set that to an actual closure using this syntax with curly braces. Now, a function looks slightly different. It's defined with a fun keyword, but it's, it works very similarly. So you call them both the same way, with brackets like that. But what this means is they're very interchangeable. Imagine we have a function called message one. It takes a string as a value, and what it does is it prints hello and then that given value. Now let's define a variable closure, which does a very similar thing, but not quite the same. Instead, it prints high in a given value. But where it's interchangeable is the fact that I can find message two to equal message one. So this closure now is a function, and then we call it, and it's actually going to print hello old comp instead of hi. So in Swift, they're the same thing, basically. So let's look at functional program by example. And I'm going to use this data set for a few examples. So basically, it's a group, it's like a set of two groups in an array. So let's do a little task. How would we go about figuring out how many people are in each of these groups? Well, imperatively, we'd probably solve the problem like this. We'd have first line as our input, it's the groups. Then we're going to create some kind of mutable array, which what we're going to do is iterate over our groups, figure out the count of each group, and then append it to our mutable array, and then finally we have the result. Now, we've used mutability here. We've like really unclear in how to follow this code. Instead, we can use a higher order function called map, a function for transforming a collection. It looks something like this. It takes two arguments, a source and a transform closure. And what it does is it returns another uh, array or sequence of a different type. That different type comes from our transform function. So the transform function is called for every element in our array in this case. And it allows us to transform it. So in this case, we're converting the array into number directly. So we use it like this. We call map, we pass it in our, in our source, 
then what we do is we pass it in the closure, which in this case has count. So it's figuring out the count of each thing and returning that. So then we get the same result, two and three. We've already shortened the code by quite a bit. You might know it's count. The definition of this is it takes a sequence, in this case, and returns an integer. Doesn't that look similar to our transform? If it takes an item, aka our sequence, and returns a type, aka our integer count. So they're equivalent. What this means is we can just pass map in the function directly. So map groups and count. And we've done the whole operation. We've gone from, I think it was six or seven lines on the first slide for our imperative approach. And now we've got one single line for actually computing it with a more declarative approach. But let's try and do another task. How would we go about ordering these people, like ordering the numbers? So we go from two and three to three and two, just ascending an order. Well, in Swift, we'd use this hired function called sorted. Now it's higher order because it takes closure for figuring out the sort order. So the first argument is the sequence. The second argument is closure, and it returns a sorted sequence. Now this is before, order before sequence looks something like this. It takes a left-hand side and a right-hand side, and then it returns whether the left-hand side is ordered before the right-hand side as the Boolean type. So let's try and use that. We have our counts, two and three. We call sorted with count. And our closure takes the left-hand side and the right-hand side, determines which one is more than each other, and returns that result. And finally, we have this array with three and two, instead of two and three. But earlier, we covered that everything was a closure, right? So our operator is a closure? Yes. More than self is a closure or a function. So more than takes the left-hand side, the right-hand side, and returns a ball. And what that means is we can pass it directly to sorted, like we did with a map. So let's look at another problem. How will we build an array of all the people? So we have two arrays inside an array of people. We just want to concatenate them into a single array with just strings. So declaratively, we might do something like this. We'd create a mutable array, in this case called people. We'd loop over each group in our groups, and then append them to our people array. And finally, we have this array of just people. Now, we can use a, a function called reduce. What this does is it allows us to concatenate them all together. It's, it looks something like this, the signature for it. It takes a sequence, it takes an initial value, which is a generic type, it takes a closure, which is a generic type, and returns the same type as the initial value. And our combine looks something like this. It takes a generic type on the left called u, it takes a value, so this is going to be called for each value inside our array of sequence. So this is going to be called with each group, and the value will be the group. And it finally returns a different type. Now this looks very similar to our plus symbol, or our prayer. This takes two things of the same type and returns something. So we can use reduce like this. We pass in our array of people, array of arrays of people, initial value of just an empty array. Now what it's going to do is it's going to call our closure on the right, the plus, each time for each element in our uh, groups. So the first time, it's going to use the initial value of the empty array. It's going to add the first group to that empty array and return it. And the second time, it's going to add the result of that to the second group. So the whole solution looks like this. We've gone from a bunch of lines just of one again. Let's try and do some else. So here we have a string, perhaps from a server or something like that. It represents the whole group serialized into a single string. Now they're separated by a new line for each group, and then each person in that is separated by a comma. Now how we do this is we will probably do something like this imperatively. We'll create a mutable array called groups, which is array of arrays of strings. We loop over each line while we separate it, and then with that we then separate them by commas figure out the actual people. And then the output, we have the whole group. Now, we could use map. Makes it slightly shorter, but not really readable. Instead, we're passing map for the separated new lines, and we're using that to transform instead of creating our mutable array. Now, we could do this perhaps a little bit better again. Perhaps we could define a function called comma separator, and it takes a string and returns it separated by commas. Now, this means our map 
doesn't have any, as much implementation details because instead we're just using this, passing its function called compromise separator, which is pretty clear what it means. But back to earlier when I said high order functions, so this includes functions or return function, which we haven't let looked at. Imagine a function called separate by takes a separator and what it returns is a function for dealing with the effort separation. And in this case, we've made an inner function which reference the separator from outside the scope and returns that so we can use this. Like, so we can create a line separator function by calling separate by with a new line and a separate comma one by passing in a comma. Now Swift has this cool syntax called currying, which basically means you can reduce that inner function into the one line. So instead of having a separate function, we pass in multiple argument brackets, which basically means the actual implementation is only even called when you call it, call all of the brackets. So we can use this to now make our complete parser for this string into this one line plus the function. So we just pass the line separate the input. It uses map to then separate all the commas. So why are map and reduce better? Well, first of all, they're pretty declarative. And they're often one-liners. And it keeps logic in one place. Instead of having a for loop where you're dealing with logic in place, you instead outsource it to a function which has one single use and just reference it. We often have immutability. And this gives us simpler, more readable, and understandable code. We use higher order functions as building blocks to build larger scale projects. But don't iterate to rope arrays. Instead, use map, use reduce. Write declaratively, not imperatively. Apple have given us a fresh slate to rethink how we code. Chance to explore declarative concepts. And out of this, you can see how DSLs can be used to reduce bugs and build simpler generic declarative languages, such as NS Predicate has built. And we've seen how functional programming can use be building declarative code. We've also seen how declarative code helps simplify and build you more testable code, which is often easier to onboard new developers. I think uh, Ash Farrow is giving a talk straight after this one about functional reactive awesomeness, which will probably cover lots of declarative examples. Definitely worth checking out. Um, slides will be available on the top link if you're interested. Um, hit me up on Twitter if you have any questions. Uh, does anyone have questions here? Any questions, team? Thanks, Kyle. Thanks.